And um, we just want to quickly look at what we will title this morning. And I tell you, I have a word from the Lord for someone here today. And um, I also pray that everything that God has put on the inside of you, um, you know, you, your life is like a seed. And inside the seed, you have great potentials buried. But the Bible tells me that except a seed falls to the ground and dies, that's when it can germinate and then bring forth and become fruitful. And as this word comes to you today, everything that is inside your life, like that seed, will come forth. You will start discovering your great potentials, and you will fulfill your potentials. Amen. Amen. Please tell somebody, there is greatness buried on the inside of you. Amen. Praise God. Um, today is the last Sunday in the month of August, and uh, we, uh, we've been following the theme, Acting on Your Passion. And by now, you should know that the passions, the desires, the joy, the fear, the hope, the love, everything you experience is God-given. That's one of the things we've learned, because we are created just like God. So we have desires, we have fears, we have hope, we have joy, we have grief, grief, you know, we grieve, we love, and we hate. All these passions you will see in God. And if you experience these passions, just know it's God-given. But it's given to you for a purpose. We liken passion to like petrol or diesel that, you know, fires an engine that makes your engine work better. So when you put petrol or diesel in your engine, it makes every component in that engine fire, fire up, and then the engine can you know reach its great and uh, greatest potential. That's the way all these desires we feel, the fears, the hope, the joy, the grief, the love, the hatred we ex express. That's what actually they do. We saw hatred and fear, two desires, uh, two passions, uh, two weeks ago, that can make you actually uh, do things. The things you hate will propel you to make a change, to change things. Usually, uh, we, we should, we've learned you can hate things, but don't hate people. When you, what you hate lies your passion and probably to help you discover the potentials God has put on the inside of you. For example, if you hate uh, wastage, you have great hatred for things wasting. That might be a sign that God has put a skill inside you now to preserve things. Uh, remembered, you know, uh, I was sharing with someone, uh, was it yesterday at the barbecue? Um, that please and please go and eat all the barbecue meat and chicken and uh, please by the way I want to appreciate all the men that put the barbecue together please let's appreciate all the men in this church they fed us yesterday we were almost fed up you know so I was telling somebody please let's finish all this chicken and all the sausages and all the chicken and uh, the barbecue I said I hate food wasted and I told the person why. I said, once upon a time in my life, I became very broke and very broken to the point that I spent and I was spent until I had no penny. I wasn't, it wasn't a case of, you know, I was down to my last penny. I was down to no penny. And uh, in those days, I had no food. That was the days I appreciated the least currency. I knew the value of a penny in those days. You know, if you don't know the value of something, you waste it. I said, please. I've learned, because those days I was hungry and I had no food to eat. So, because I had no food to eat, I began to appreciate every little food I saw. And I realized that people 
who are hungry, you don't have food to eat. So please don't waste food. Please. Don't waste food. And if you look at Jesus, he fed people. There were baskets left over. He told them, please make sure nothing gets wasted. Please tell your neighbor you are not a waste of space. Ah, you are here to fulfill a purpose. And you will fulfill it. Amen. So today we will look at the passions of Jesus. And uh, that's what we will just quickly look at. And I have the word of the Lord for somebody. Listen, Jesus was not, Jesus was born a king, but he was not born in a palace. The Bible says he was born king of the Jews. So potentially as a baby, he had every potential to become the king of the Jews. Like, you know, but of course we know he wasn't scripturally king of the Jews, but king of kings, lord of lords. But he was born king. So you would expect that somebody born a king should be born in Buckingham Palace, isn't it? But he wasn't. Where was he born? In the filthiest of the filthiest places you can imagine. You know, we, we, we read some of these things and we even ask them at Christmas. But I wish we could try to picture what it means to be born in a manger where cows and uh, you know, uh, eating straw, and uh, the, the, the same place they do number one and number two. The place was filthy and smelling and stinking. That was where King Jesus was born. Can I tell you something? It doesn't matter where you were born. What matters is what you were born for. There are great potentials on the inside of you. Stop wishing you were not born where you were born. Stop wishing the circumstances of your birth was different. If the circumstances of birth was going to determine Jesus' future, then he wouldn't have been born in the manger. So wherever you were born, you are still born to reign. Kings reign and you will reign in life. Please, can you tell yourself, I was born to reign. In this life, and I'm going to reign. So, let's see King Jesus. He was born, and let's remember, was born a baby. And then he grew. The Bible records an account when he was a baby. He was brought after eight days. And then we see when he became 12. And then all of a sudden we saw when he was 30 years old. And then we saw the next thir- three years or three and a half years. And then he died. And uh, one of the greatest things we have to learn about Jesus is this. Even though Jesus died roughly at the age of 33 if anybody dies at 33 today, we'll say, oh, that was a wasted life. But do you realize that Jesus died at 33 and Jesus died, he said, it is finished. He died fulfilled. He died empty. He died finishing the purpose for which he was born. It's not how long you live, it's how well you live that matters. Are you doing what you were born for? Or you are waiting till you become 40? What if you don't live until you are 40? Your best life is now. Faith, the Bible says in the chapter 11 of Hebrews, that now faith is the evidence. It's now. So you have to start living your life now and stop waiting for some magic or stop waiting for something to change or your circumstances to be different. Everything God has put inside of you, this message is to propel you. Stay up those passions. But let's learn from Jesus. We will see Jesus right from when he was a baby. So let's see. The Bible tells us, we will use uh, this passage as um, like the background passage. Now, let's turn to the book of Hebrews. Hebrews and uh, chapter 12. Hebrews chapter 12. And um, I think it's there about in, I'll get the passage for us now. Hebrews chapter 12, let's read from verse, um, let me just get it for us quickly. Verse 2, or rather let's read from verse 1. Verse 1 will help us to see the real context. The Bible says, Wherefore, seeing also we are compassed with, about with such a great crowd of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and every 
sin, the sin that so easily besets us. In other words, please, stop living your life, you know, I'm just giving a little bit of explanation here. Stop living your life giving excuses. Oh, it's because of this, it's because of that, it's because of this. Please lay aside all those excuses and all those weights and get rid of sin. The Bible says the sin which so easily besets us. And let us run with patience. There's a race that is set before you. And the Bible said, run this race in verse 2, looking unto Jesus. So let's see Jesus. The Bible said, the author and the finisher of our faith, who for the joy, look at his passion, joy was set before him, he endured the cross. That was painful. The Bible said, he despised the shame. Are you being mocked? Are you being, you know, spoken about? You know, some of us, the reason why we will never do the things we ought to do is because of what people are saying about us. And the words that people have spoken about us have affected us so much that some of us are actually losing our confidence. And you, uh, you don't have the self-confidence to do the things you really want to do. Look, no more excuses. Jesus despised the shame. It's high time you get to a point in your life, I don't care what people are saying about me. Do you know they said worse things about Jesus? Jesus only healed. They said he was a devil. At some point, they didn't even call him devil. They said he was the chief of the devils. At some point, they mocked him literally and you know, literally called him a bastard. That, you know, of course we know Mary, but of course we, know, we don't know who your father is. And when he was trying to tell them about God, you know, they just wouldn't have any of it, none of it. So Jesus despised every shame. And the Bible said he's, he, he despised the shame and he set, he was set down today at the right hand of the throne of God, reigning. So you are going to reign in life because Jesus went through everything that you are going through right now and let's see how he did it. Jesus had passion. So let's see passion number one of Jesus. And um, we have a little slide. So just bring passion number one, the passions of Jesus. In Luke chapter 2 and verse 43. We see Jesus at the age of 12. And you know the story. I'll spell the story, right? Just a little background. At 12, they go to Jerusalem and they were going back with uh, the family and they discovered Jesus was no longer in the company. So they went back and for about three days they were searching for him. And then when they found him, they found him in the temple. 12-year-old boy, what was he doing in the temple? The Bible said when they had fulfilled the number of days... They returned the child Jesus tarried behind in Jerusalem. And Joseph and his mother, they did not know about it. And then verse 44. They, supposing him to have been in their company, they went a day's journey and they, they were looking at, you know, for him. And then verse 45. Let's see what Jesus was doing. They, found, they didn't find him. They went back to Jerusalem. They were searching for him. And then in verse 46. After three days, they found him where? In the temple, sitting in the midst of doctors, put hearing them, and asking questions. Jesus had a passion for knowledge. That's the first passion we see in Jesus. Do you realize something about children? How you can begin to recognize a child's passion? Is find out what are the questions the child is always asking. You know, some children are so curious, they ask questions, and we adults either tell them the wrong answer because we feel they are too young to know, or we tell them, shut up, don't be asking that kind of questions. You know, questions like, Daddy, how are babies made? You know what I mean. And then, unfortunately, some parents might think they are being wise, and then they give them a wrong answer. Do you realize that you are sowing a seed in that child's... A child that has grown up to a point to be asking questions should start showing you the passion that child may have. Maybe a child asking you that question, God is trying to reveal to you, maybe that guy is going to become a gynecologist or a medical doctor. Or you see a child trying to put apart his toy. He wants to see what's inside it. I remember a friend of mine, uh, he, he said he will never forget uh, a beating 
he, he, he received one day from his uh, uh, supposed parents or adopted parents because they bought this uh, piece of um, stereo or stereo in those days. You, know, you don't have all this iPad or iPod and all the eyelashes and every eye, you know, now. And he was curious. He wants to see what's talking inside that thing. What's making that thing talk. So you know what he did? He found out how to open it and he pieced it. He got a beating of his life that day. But little did the parents know that this guy was actually an electrical, electronic engineer in the making. He grew up following that passion. But the beating he received discouraged him from opening further things until he was old enough <laughs> to buy things for himself and open it. I'm just trying to let us see. Jesus sat, he had a passion for knowledge. He wanted to know. He wanted to understand. He wanted to acquire wisdom. The Bible tells me in verse 52, And the child Jesus grew in wisdom, in stature, in favor with God and with man. How was he growing? We see a key, a passion for knowledge. He was asking questions. Please, when our children ask us questions, let us try to answer with the right answers as much as possible. At least get down to the child's level and try to explain. Jesus had passion. So you see your child curious about things. Don't tell him he's stupid for being curious. Just try to uh, channel this passion. And some of us will identify with that. Maybe the story I just told now, you can identify with some things you were curious with when you were around about 12 and because you were dealt with so badly, you are now discouraged. Please go back to that passion you had. Passion number two, we see Jesus in Luke chapter 2, the same chapter 2 and verse 49, when they asked Jesus, why did you stay back? We've been looking for you. We were sorrowing. Jesus, you've done so You know, you didn't do us well. The Bible said, Jesus answered them. Should I not? Why are you looking for me? Please just give us a simpler version. Do you have uh, like the New International Version or the Amplified? You know, let's just simplify things today. And Jesus grew, not verse verse 49. Luke chapter 2 verse 49, please. Right? It's on the screen. We asked them, 49. Verse 49. They asked him, why did you do this to us? What did he say? He said, should I not go about why are you looking for me? Say, so why were you searching for me? He asked. Didn't you know I had to be about my father's business? That should let us see another passion Jesus had a passion for his father's business. But let's look at it here. You know, biologically or physically speaking, who was his father? Not biologically, but physically. Joseph. Who was Joseph? A carpenter. But what's he doing inside the temple? Do carpenters stay in the temple? No. So which father is he talking about here? Heavenly father. So you can already start seeing where this child is tending towards. You see a young child interested in reading the Bible at 12. You know, don't stop the child. Don't stop the child. No, 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 no. I don't want you to become a priest. You know, I have two stories there. A friend of mine said he grew up. Mother trained him, sent him to the university, read all the engineering he could read, and he was now practicing. And he found out that he was never fulfilled. Never, ever, ever, ever found fulfillment in the work he was doing. So one day he was just climbing the house, you know, Engineers just trying to do something. And he just thought to himself, what if he falls down from here and he dies? He will die unhappy. He said, something is wrong with me. Something. And he found out that he just loved the Lord. He just loved the Bible. He just loved being in church. He just loved it. He just loved it. And uh, he decided to quit his job and go into kind of a full-time ministry as a missionary. And his, fa- and his mother, his father was late at this time. The, father w- the mother was very unhappy. So he said he, he, he just couldn't have it. One day he went to the mother. I said, tell me about my story. Tell me what happened to me. I know you didn't have me early. You know, the mother was praying for a child and did not have a child until maybe about 10 years. That's when he had the boy. She said, well, 
It's true. When I heard you, before I heard you, I prayed to God, Lord, if you give me a baby, I'll give the baby back to you to serve you all the days of his life. He said, why didn't you tell me all this? Why, why did you send me to go and study engineering? The passion was in him to be a missionary. Today, successful missionary quit his job. I'm not saying go and quit your job now. That's not the, or quit school now. Let me tell you, because the engineering and everything he learned in school were only working together for his good. Because there's always a set time. There's an appointed time. Everything you learn, no knowledge is wasted. Now he's applying all his university knowledge, but he's applying it now as a missionary. So don't say now, yes, yes, the pastor has hit it. Give me the copy of this tape I sent to my parents at home and quit in uni. I did not say that. It's on tape and it's recorded. I never said so. Everybody say amen. amen. Uh -huh. Right? There is an appointed time just to let you see some passions. You might be studying law, but you find out you love meat. So maybe you should go and open an abattoir. Right? I, I'm just telling you, I had a friend who studied uh, pharmacy and he opened a, a meat, a barbecue shop making a lot of money and he quit his pharmaceutical job. But today, after making a lot of money with his barbecue stuff, he made a lot of money, opened a pharmaceutical shop. He's running that as a business, but he's following his passion. So no knowledge was wasted. So the money is getting from drugs, not selling drugs, you know, but <laughs> <laughs> he's diversifying it into business, into his passion. So his father's business was that his will be done on earth as it is in heaven. That's God's business. Because when Jesus now began to preach when he was 30, he said, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Everything he began to live for, he began to manifest as a little child. I believe some passions have been stirred up now. Now, passion number three, we see in Jesus. Acts chapter 10 verse 38. The Bible tells us, how God anointed Jesus Christ of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and with power. And what happened? He went about doing good and healing all those who were oppressed of the devil. Jesus went about doing good. We see a passion there. Jesus had a passion for doing good. A passion for doing good. Good. I know some people can have a passion for doing evil. Right? But that's the wrong passion. Let me just tell you. That's not godly. Don't remind me of my friend when we were in university. He's always happy when bad things happen to people. He said it just amuses him. He just loves hearing bad stories and bad things happening to people. And, you know, I just couldn't stand him. Because I don't think I shared in that kind of a passion. So I cut off friendship from him. The Bible says flee from all appearances of evil. Right? A friend could be an appearance of evil. A friend can kill your passion. I mean, little did I know today I will be preaching. But if probably I followed him, I will be doing the other side now. But thank God he's saved now. And uh, God can turn evil around for good. So rather than you being happy that some, but some bad things happen to people, turn that into another side. Be angry at evil. So the Bible says Jesus went about doing good. And, you know, in a way, what, what was this good he was doing? The Bible said he was healing all those who were oppressed of the devil. So Jesus had this passion. He just didn't want people sick. Did you follow Jesus? He was always going everywhere. And healing. Jesus one day was passing and he saw a woman, a widow, whose son, only son died. And they were going through a funeral procession. Jesus spoiled the funeral. Right? And raised that child from the dead. You know, Jesus even broke the law. Because he was passionate about healing. He went into the temple on the Sabbath day that they said, don't work. What did Jesus do? He healed. That's passion. And they told him, no, don't, don't, don't heal on the Sabbath day. 
on the Sabbath day, you don't, you don't work. Nobody works here. The Pharisees, the Sadducees, the chief priests were telling him all that. But he told them, no. You see, your passion will let you see beyond some legal limits that even the law can put on you. You'll find a way around it. Do you know why Jesus found a way around it? He told them, you are a hypocrite. If you have a cattle or an ox falls into the pit on the Sabbath day because you say the law says don't work, would you not take that cattle out? And that shut their mouths. Your passion will give you wisdom. You will be able to walk around things. Have you met lawyers before? I mean crazy, passionate lawyers. They have a way. When they defend you, they will find a loophole in the law. There's a lawyer in this country called Mr. Loophole. He always finds loopholes. See me after the service. I'll give his name. (laughs) I don't know him. I don't know him. But that was, you, 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 you know, he's passionate. And he will go to the court. Even with the law written black and white, and still win. That's passion. That is passion. So Jesus was healing. He was bringing relief from, for everyone who was oppressed of the devil. And Jesus is still passionate about you today. He's still the same yesterday, today, and forever. So if you are here and you are in need of healing, I'm telling you, Jesus is more passionate for you to be healed than anything. And I believe that as you're hearing this word, the healing of Jesus has begun to manifest in your body. Just receive the healing. If you are being oppressed of the devil in the name of Jesus I command every oppression of the enemy upon your life to cease in the name of Jesus. Because Jesus is passionate about that. And he said, whatsoever you ask in my name, it's in his character to heal. It's in his character to relieve us of evil oppression. So fear no evil. Passion number four, the passions of Jesus. We see this in Mark chapter 6 and verse 34. Mark chapter 6 verse 34, Jesus had a passion for teaching the truth. The Bible said in Mark chapter 6 and verse 34, Jesus when he came out, he saw much people and he was moved with compassion towards them. Right? Why? Because there were sheep having no shepherd. And what did he do? He began to teach. Because there's a way teaching will bring understanding and guidance. When people are not taught, that's when they don't know what to do. When people are not taught. How many of us here, right, in your life, you've passed through a teacher? Please, anybody. Only a few people. In your life, you've had a teacher. You've passed under a teacher. You've been under the ministry of a I mean a teacher, I'm talking of, not spiritually now, a teacher, whether you are in kindergarten or you never went to school. Everybody. Can you see how important it is? And there are some of us here, you, there are some teachers you'll never forget. I'll never forget my math teacher. Because he always beat us when we miss it. That's not very nice. They can't do that in your generation, you know. No, aren't you fortunate? In our days, they smack you when you fail. Why are you laughing? (laughs) Smack you. I had this crazy math teacher. He was so passionate about his students learning maths. Were you smacked, Steve, in your days? No, how come? In your days, they used to smack in this country. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Thank you, Severa. Yeah, yeah, got smacked a few times. But you can't do that again. I'm a teacher, professionally, I can't smack. I don't want to smack anyway. But, um, you know, this math teacher, he will just come, just give examples, and then you work it out, you miss it, you get the number of strokes, right, that is correspondent to how much you miss. But, you know, he took his passion to an extreme. He had another passion, that is for smacking. So I remember one day he came into the class. He said, ah, how come all of you did well in maths? Because we all did well out of fear. There's a way fear can prepare you also. So we, 
I said, no, 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 no. Ah, he said, I'm, my hands are itching me. Say, so, so what does that mean? He said, he wants to smack. So he called the class captain. We had a class captain, you know, class representative. Maybe that's what you call it now. He said, come, 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 class rep. Come, come, come here. How, who are the naughty boys in this class? So the class captain, too, was, wanted to protect his own. He said, excuse me, sir, there are no naughty boys in this class anymore. He said, what do you mean? He just got his cane and then acted out his passion. No naughty boy, this guy, bah, as he was smacking him, Gerard, oh, oh, oh. as he was calling them, you were jumped at him, I was acting on his passion. He laid many stripes, and by those stripes, we were healed. <laughs> that was, how many of us know that was a wicked passion? Because your passion, if you're not careful, like petrol, that's meant to fire your engine, can also burn down the car. If you, uh, if you get too passionate, that's just the balance we have to get here. You get too passionate, you can kill people out of passion. So balance things. Jesus had a passion for teaching. He saw people. He had compassion on them. He was moved with compassion. And he saw that these people have, they were like sheep without shepherd. What was the solution? Teaching. And what was he teaching? He was teaching the word of God. He was teaching the gospel. You see, all through the gospels, looking at Jesus, we hear that Jesus entered into the temple on uh, the Sabbath and taught. You will hear Jesus borrow a boat where there were a multitude, moved away a little bit from the shore, from the boat, he taught the people. And the Bible tells me in the book of Luke chapter 5, as he was teaching the power of God, was present to heal. There's so much power. So Jesus had the passion for teaching. Because as he was teaching, power was being released. Passion number five that Jesus... We see, we're talking about the passions of Jesus. Passion number five. In Mark chapter 11, verse 15 to 17, one day Jesus enters into the temple of God and he saw chaos. He saw disorder. He saw people in the temple buying and selling. He saw money changers. He saw those who were selling doves. He saw those who were selling oil. He entered, the Bible said, he went to make a scourge. And then he went and drove everybody out of that temple. Those who were buying and selling. Those who were uh, exchanging money in the temple. And the Bible said, it's the zeal of the house of the Lord that made him do it. He was passionate about order in the house of God. He, anywhere Jesus entered, he brought order. Any life Jesus touched, he brought order into that life. Because sickness is a sign of disorder. So Jesus will come and reorder your body and make you healed. In the temple of God, Jesus will always restore order. That is one of the characteristics you find about God. Right from Genesis chapter 1. The earth in verse 1, Genesis chapter 1, was without form, void, darkness, was upon the face of the deep. What happened? God began to bring order. Light appear. Dry land. Sea. Separate here. Land. Heaven. And then he created cattle, vegetation. Have you seen the earth we live in? It was designed by the master and the greatest architect. Designed. And do you know one thing? He designed your body also. That is why you are fearfully and wonderfully made. Forget about it. Are people telling you you are not handsome? Or people are telling you you are not beautiful? Or you've looked at yourself and you've told yourself you are not beautiful. Next time you look in the mirror and you tell yourself you are not beautiful, you are telling God he is not beautiful. Because you look like God. God looks like you. God looks like everybody. That should tell you how big God is because there are over 6 billion people and no two people really look alike. Even if they look alike, they don't sound alike. 
Even if they sound alike, they don't have the same fingerprints. How did he do it? That's to let you see how much God carefully, fearfully, meticulously took time to create you. Please, can you appreciate yourself? If nobody appreciates you. And I'm not, I'm not trying to make anybody feel good here. I'm just telling you the truth. I'm telling you the truth. You tell yourself you're ugly, you're telling God is ugly. And God isn't. He created you fearfully, wonderfully. You see, that shape of your head you don't like is the uniqueness. Right? There are some places that head with his shape will get you to. <laughs> that somebody with what you think is a normal head shape can't enter. You don't know. A man's gift will make room for him. Start celebrating the things you don't like about yourself. Start celebrating them. See your nose. See your lips. See your height. See your stature. Celebrate it. But don't eat too much. Okay. Because that's sowing it. And you will reap. When you sow too much food or too much junk, you will reap it. So get a balance. Because... Did you realize that when God created all the plants and everything, God told man what to eat and what not to eat? It's not everything you should eat. It's not everything. It's not everything. There are some things I know if I eat, I just realized, you know, I was telling my wife, there's this uh, delicacy, I won't tell you which one. I won't tell you. Do you want to know? No, I won't tell you. <laughs> I realized that every time I eat it now, Steve, my stomach can't handle it. So no matter how much I love it, I told my wife, I'm not eating this again. Yeah. Is that not common sense? Yeah. yeah. There's a time for everything under heaven. There's a time for barbecue and a time to refrain from barbecue. There's a time for pepper and a time to refrain from pepper. There's a time for pepperoni pizza and a time to refrain. Right? If you realize that you and pepperoni pizza is not compatible with your body. If you eat it, you get blown up. Stop it. Wisdom. Just ask your neighbor, that food you don't like, give it to me. <laughs> Alright, let's go to Jesus. Passion number six. Right? Are you writing? Or can you remember? What was passion number one? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Check your notes. You are allowed to. Number one, passion number one, Jesus had passion for... Passion number two, Jesus had passion four. And then number three, for doing good. And please let me just say this. The definition of good that I got is anything that brings healing or brings relief from evil oppression is good. So think if you want to be like Jesus and you're thinking of something good to do, think about it. This thing, if I do it, will it heal? Will it relieve from the oppression of the enemy? Do you know through that you can actually discover a passion and propel you to do something you've always wanted to do? Just ask yourself, is this thing good? Will it heal somebody? If I sell this kind of food, will it heal? If I open this kind of business, will it relieve people? Right? And also, of course, you get blessed by doing a business. Jesus said, I must go about my father's business. I'm telling you that statement healed me many years ago because I had a phobia for people who did business. I just didn't like businessmen many years ago until I saw Jesus himself did business. The father did business. All through the Bible, you see all the patriarchs, they were in one business or the other. So if you are here and probably you think, no, business is not for me. I've met people like business is not for me. It's for you. It is. Everyone should be doing one business or the other. And please mind your own business, part of your own kiddo. But I own tea, sugar, your own bread. Oh, no. Okay, now. <laughs> okay, pastor number four. Yeah? Was what? For teaching the truth. And then number five. Order. 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 If there's disorder in your life, in your body, in your mind, Jesus is here 
to restore order in the name of Jesus. And then number six, passion for praying. Look at Mark chapter 1 verse 35. Look at this. And some of us will identify something here by the Spirit of God. Now, in Mark chapter 1 verse 35, the Bible said Jesus, please, a simpler version again, so that we can really see this. Just see this and then you will see something. The Bible said in Mark chapter 1 verse 35, very early in the morning, while it was still dark, Jesus got up, left the house, I love this version, went off to a solitary place to pray. When did he do this? Very early, when it was dark. What are the things that at any point in time when they wake you up, no matter how early it is, you love doing. That's your passion. That's your passion. It might be a sign of something that is a passion to you. Remember, it's got to be something good. Because some people will say, now, yes. Yes. Because very early in the morning, people wake up to plot evil. That maybe that's my passion. No. Oh, very early in the morning, I just love to go on Facebook, social um, network sites. Do you know that can be good and that can be bad? Right? If all you go there to do very early in the morning is to just look for uh, who to insult or, or, or who to chase, let's see where I can get, you know. Actually, you, maybe you might have a passion to create a social networking site, right, that will actually be bringing relief to people. The people who created all your Facebook and all that, I'm sure they tarried all night before they got it. So what is it that when you wake up in the morning, no matter how early it is, maybe it's to go on PlayStation and play football, Barcelona versus uh, 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 what's that team? Athletic Madrid. I don't think that's a good passion, you know. But, maybe you might have a passion to create another PlayStation that people would play early in the morning and, you know, they would feel good about it. A Bible PlayStation. Have you ever thought about that? You know, you, let, let me sell one idea to you. I never used to like all these social web uh, networking sites. It's just recently I got on it. And then I got on Twitter, right? But I always hide there. You know, I don't put my name there. But it's recently I'm coming out slowly. And I came out, <laughs> I came with this idea. Think about this. If somebody can just create a Bible, right? A Bible that tweets. Just open the Bible. Just tweet a verse to you. I don't know how that is possible. Just tweet. And then I began to think one day, what if Jesus was on Twitter? What will Jesus tweet? And I began to think. It got me thinking. Because I always try to just figure out how to, how can we turn these things in a, in a purer, in a good sense. So what would Jesus tweet? And one of the things that came to me was that Jesus will tweet one day. He thought too, I tweeted nothing. <laughs> except what my Heavenly Father tweeted, that I tweeted. He gave me an idea. I will not tweet anything that will offend God. So I got on Twitter. Yeah. yeah. So I tweet one-liners on the Love Assembly Twitter. At Love Assembly, all the tweets there, I just tweet them. So that somebody reads them and they are happy. They feel good. And it heals them. Not that you tweet something. I just eight pounded here. Yeah. Like I was seeing something somebody tweeted one day. Revenge is so sweet. <laughs> you know, how do you feel reading a tweet like that? Revenge is so sweet. That shows you that the person has probably just revenged. The Bible says, Vengeance is my said the Lord. So I felt like tweeting back to the person. Vengeance is my said the Lord. Thou shalt not revenge. Tweet. So, 
What is it? Very early in the morning. If they wake you up, you're fired up to do. That's a passion. Jesus was fired up to pray. And uh, let me tell us something. That was one of the greatest secrets of Jesus' success. Because Jesus said, I don't do anything except what my Heavenly Father does, tells me to do. So in the place of prayer, Jesus goes to engage his Father in a dialogue, not a monologue. We think prayer is a monologue. It is not. It's a dialogue. You talk to God, God talks to you. God is more willing to talk to you more than you are even willing to talk to him. That's one thing people don't really realize. A prayer meeting is we come in three hours and we talk for three non-stop hours. Ta, 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 ta. When we don't have anything to pray, we manufacture something. You know, I've been in a prayer meeting before when somebody said, right, everybody just bring, do as if you have a gun in the prayer meeting because we had exhausted all the prayers we could pray, all the prayer points. Say, so bring out a gun. Just do as if you have a set. Say, yes. So everybody to the heaven. So we went. Say, so just be making the sound. I lie not. So we all went. He said, you have dislodged the demons in heavens. Now go. Just around. So we all went. You see all manner of people. So now you've dislodged all the demons around. So now go. Everybody under. It was serious. People were. Until people were sweating. Because we had to talk for three non-stop hours. That is not prayer. That's not just prayer. Ecclesiastes chapter 5 says when we come before God, be ready to listen more than you speak. So, kneel down before God, worship Him. Keep silent. God will speak to you. Have you ever thought about it? Jesus said, I don't do anything except what I hear or see my Father. How? Where? 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 It's in the place of prayer. God will show you things about your life. God will show you the things to do. God will show you where to go, where not to go. If only you are ready, sorry, for that Bible. I probably create something that when I take a Bible, the Bible can fly back like that, you know, to its owner. You know, in the place of prayer, kneel down. Or take any posture. I was discussing with Griggs. Where's Reverend Griggs? Where are you? Okay, he's at the back there. I said, we think. This is the greatest mistake we make. We think is when we kneel down and we sing five songs, slow worship, uh, and uh, we sit down. That's when God hears us. The moment you woke up, God heard your thought. He had everything you were thinking. And then we think God is a hypocrite. He will pretend as if he didn't hear what you are thinking. It's when you now come to him and you... You know, we have perfected hypocrisy before God. Huh? Like a woman. Right, let me tell you the story of this woman. We were praying for this woman. We were praying, praying, praying. What was the problem? The husband left her. So we, we, we were really praying, God, in the name of Jesus, we bind every devil that is deceiving this man. And that woman that he went after, in the name of Jesus, we send confusion, we send fire, we send brimstone, in the name of Jesus. You know, and we prayed and prayed and prayed and prayed. Until one woman, who was not a Christian, just called us one. He said, what's wrong with you Christians? We didn't understand her. He said, you are praying for this woman. That her husband should come back. Say, all of you are hypocrites. Say, how? Say, that woman took another man's husband. The man you are praying to be restored back to him. She actually took the man from another woman. In the name of Jesus. <laughs> so you are praying. Who are you praying to? That's the question. So God did not know she stole another Woman's, no, I have to get it now. Another woman's husband. Because I would say another man's wife. But it's okay. So God didn't know. Right? So the God who were praying and binding and losing and sending, telling him to send demons and all that. Right? 
didn't know this woman was actually living in adultery. And God, out of his love, probably delivered her by allowing the man to just go. So what are you praying? Steve, we stopped praying from then on. We started giving thanks to God. And, you know, the Holy Spirit is the comforter. So it is well, sister. It is well. It is well. After all, just live your life. Uh, walk a Christian life. Uh, you know, the Bible says some people are made eunuchs for the kingdom's sake. Some people make themselves eunuchs and all that. You know, no, no, don't worry. It is well. Just, just leave them. Let him go. Because it was never your husband. We don't like such truths. But people are so deceived. She probably think, no, those people don't have anointing. Let's go to another place. And they will take your money. They will take your money. Just like a woman showed me. Uh, some people said they will be praying for her. But she, this is their account. Just be sending transfer money. We will keep praying for you. They are after your money. Not after your deliverance. Because the more they pray for you, God will answer. Why? Because God is not mocked. Whatever a man sows, he will reap. Right? So let's learn to pray. Let's learn to hear God. Lord, why is this? What should we do? That, is that not better? Uh, excuse me, is that not better? Rather than you deceiving yourself. You think it's when you shout, shout, shout. Right? Get. <sighs> the Bible talks about praying and miss. It's not that you are praying, but you are missing it. So let's learn to pray. Jesus taught us to pray. What did he say? After this manner pray ye, our Father, who art in thy, hallowed be your, uh uh-huh, uh-huh, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Do they tell somebody else's husband and pray that the person will come back? Today. So, you know, the things we pray about, please let's pray and write. Let's pray according to the will of God. Jesus listened. His father spoke to him. There was never a prayer Jesus prayed God didn't answer. The only time we see that Jesus couldn't hear was in Mark chapter 6. The Bible said he went there. They despised him. Is this not the carpenter? Don't we know his brothers? The Bible said he couldn't heal them. He healed a few sick people. Why? Because of unbelief. That will stop your prayers from being answered. And let me tell us something. Do you think God does not know when you believe and when you don't? No, 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 no. No, 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 no. Please, let, let, let there be healing today. Do you think God does not recognize you are praying out of unbelief when you are praying? God sees the heart. God does not see the way man sees. That's why Jesus taught us in that Lord's Prayer that we should say, Father, forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. If you ask for forgiveness, even if you have sinned, it is in the power of God to forgive. Ask for forgiveness. Stop binding the devil. There's a time to bind the devil. There's a time to go and plead to God, please forgive me. Forgive me. I brought this upon myself. Don't waste people's prayer. Don't go, don't go and set up prayer chain over nothing. Because it's God we are praying to. Are you? It's God. Is it not God who will answer the prayer? You know, some people can pray. Fire, Father, kill somebody. Kill that person. Kill this person. Kill that. Who will kill the person? No, no, no. Who will answer the prayer? I'm, I, excuse me. I have a problem there. Maybe I, 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 Maybe you need to help me. I don't understand who people are praying to at times. Just pray. You think you can twist God's hands? Just twist it. Father, kill all my enemies. Kill them, kill them. Meanwhile, you are the enemy of God. Who will God kill first? It's not funny. I'm just sharing my passion with us today. I hate deception. With passion. I have been deceived in my life. My family have been deceived. Lord, I want to know you. I want to really know you. And I found out that knowing God is knowing his word. John 1 1 says, In the beginning was the word, the word was with God, and the word was 
God. If you want to know God, look, don't bring anything extra from His Word if you want to know Him. If anybody tells you anything that is extra scriptural, it is not God. End of story. It is not God. Let's stop and deceive. Final passion. Jesus had a passion for doing the will of the Father. He said in John chapter 4 verse 34, I'll close with this. John chapter 4 verse 34. They came to him one day. Let me just paraphrase this. He said, have you eaten? Has he eaten? And then he answered them. My food. Huh? It's not all this cucumber and uh, lentils and uh, 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 chicken, dog chicken, dog chili. Tell me all the chilies you chill. How special. There's another one called how special. Please stretch your hands towards this. <laughs> Jesus said, my food. Huh? Said Jesus is to do what? The will of him that sent me and to finish. That was his passion. Whether he ate or not. Do you know there are some things you are so passionate about you forget about food? But please eat. Because food is fuel on itself. So eat. But there's a place also for fasting where you abstain from food so that you can focus on God. Right? So that is it. So he was passionate. That's the last passion about doing the will of the Father and finishing it. Doing the will of the Father and finish it. I want to prophesy on somebody today. You will do the will of God who created you. You will finish it. Jesus was passionate. The will of the Father is that no man should perish. He went about harvesting souls. He taught 12 men, trained them, and told them, go and multiply more. Go ye into all the nations and teach everybody to observe everything I have commanded you. That's in Matthew chapter 18 from verse 18 to 20. So Jesus was passionate. That's the will of the Father. He was so passionate about doing it. Let me tell you something. You are not a biological accident. No matter how you came into this world, there is a purpose for your life. There is. Whether you know your father or you don't know your father, or you don't know your mother, or you don't even know who they are, you are not an accident. Accident. Realize the passions that are on the inside of you and use it for God's glory. Let's bow our heads to pray. Father, I thank you. I thank you in the name of Jesus. If you are in need of any healing right now, just lay hands on yourself. Hands are not going to be laid on you, but I command in the name of Jesus. Father, if I have spoken your word and you are not a man, you cannot lie. You said in your word that you watch over your word to perform. Your word, when it is sent, it brings healing and deliverance from destruction. Right now, I command every sickness, every disorder, every disease in these lives, physically, emotionally, spiritually, I decree order in your life right now in the name of Jesus. I command every sickness to go. I command every disease to go. In the name of Jesus, whatsoever my heavenly Father has not planted. My Father has not planted that disease in your body. It is written, it shall be uprooted. Every disease from the very root be uprooted from your body. Right now, in the name of Jesus, receive your healing. Whether it is emotional, whether it is physical, just receive it right now. I'll give us a minute, just talk to the Lord. Talk to him. Some people are here. All you need to realize is just ask God for forgiveness. For mercy. Mercy. That's all you need. Some of us just receive your healing. Receive your healing. Your healing. God is doing a perfect and a complete work. You will testify 
I decree in the name of Jesus, you are going to testify of the goodness of the Lord. I rebuke that spirit of suicide. Somebody here is battling with suicidal thoughts. In the name of Jesus, I rebuke that spirit. I rebuke that lie. It is the lie of the enemy. Hear the truth. You will live. You shall not die. You will fulfill the number of your days. Right now, I decree. I decree. I decree in the name of Jesus. No weapon that is formed or fashioned against you shall prosper. Every weapon that is being used by the enemy against you, right now, it is written, they shall not prosper. I decree right now, you are a lawful captive. Lawfully, you should be in captivity. By reason of whatever mistake you have made, but hear ye the word of the Lord. With the Lord is abundant mercy. Receive the mercy of the Lord. And he that Jesus sets free, is free indeed. Thank God for your liberty. Just open your mouth and thank him. Thank him, thank him, thank him.